there's something similar about how different reaction times to the same event produce variegated depths of reflection. Take the news, for example. The internet and rolling news channels have clearly taken over in terms of providing us with instant facts as and when they unfold. Another bomb has been detonated in Iraq. Tiger Woods is really, really, really sorry. Yeah, yeah, but so what? Well, slower, old-fashioned print media simply can't compete with all of this aggregation, and thus, its new urgent task is to provide informed opinion and critical reflection. This actually happens best when there's a notable time delay between the event, the reflection, and the, po the public vocalization. Well, I agree that a relationship to time comes to the forefront here. How much perspective can one have, much less organize, and offer an immediate intervention like ours? What is lost and what is gained in the attention deficit disorder approach? What are some of the main differences between us presenting our fragmented findings versus the more faithful collection of published transcripts, for example? Surely one is more thorough and exact than the other, but what comes out of these dark spots and these cracks well, in the information? I have a hunch, and it's just a hunch, that Doug McLennan's keynote talk and the panel, which is called Is There a Crisis in Arts Writing, that follow us will be grappling with some of these brain teasers. Maybe I'm paranoid, Haig, but I feel that the art world kind of enjoys being in crisis. It seems to get a kick out of it. Is there a crisis of crises? It seems that positioning yourself at some sort of frontier opens up an epistemological space to theorize things more freely. This idea of being on the verge of, or the end of something, and the beginning of a new paradigm. Or maybe... Or maybe it's just a way of invoking a sense of peril to make things sound a bit more exciting. In any case, what are some of the other critical moments we're touring through, Hey, Well, I think it's important to talk about the tension between the necessity for institutions, whether or not they matter at all, on the one hand, and the need to circumvent them with softer alternatives on the other. Is that yet another crisis? Yes. We're on the verge of the complete and utter collapse of the museum. The very institutional grounds we are standing on are disappearing as we speak, thus opening up a liminal space of an alternate potential, Schumann. Jeez, I had no idea things were that bad. I guess there seems to be a mistrust of whether institutions such as schools or museums can be agile enough to respond to a particular moment that has no precedent. This might be because the institution is tied up with all kinds of economic and political obligations, but at the same time, artists, curators, critics, some of whom are sitting here in this room, actively and happily seek the validation and opportunities that these institutions can offer. Hey, do you think that's weird? Like a contradiction that's worth worrying about? Well, I think that everything is weird and worth worrying about, especially when it comes to economic and political dimensions of these questions. But perhaps it is more useful to talk about the practical or impractical aspects of this relationship. I feel that many artists feel restless with regards to the institutions. Artists are much faster at updating and relocating themselves than institutions are, no matter how nimble they may be. So that's kind of got to do with the heaviness of institutions? Yes, exactly. It also has to do with their rigidity. Anton Vidocle talked about these things in Doha on Monday, saying that a part of why he looked for alternative venues for some of his projects was because the, discuss the discussions could continue in informal ways until 2 a.m. if needed. Just as he was saying that, the museum staff signaled him to wrap it up as the museum was about to close at 5 p.m. Ah, typical. There's also the tendency, isn't there, as we learn of in, in Doha, where artists seem to co-opt the nomenclature, the language of cultural institutions, without necessarily fulfilling the traditional roles that these titles invoke. For example, there's Karen Mertzer and Brad Butler's so-called Museum of Non-Participation which seems to locate itself literally and figuratively in the practice of everyday life, something that the Center for Possible Studies, which is also currently based in London, seeks to do. They, on the other hand, exist, it seems, because the Serpentine Gallery acts as a sort of patron or a facilitator, making the Center for Possible Studies a non-institutional satellite wing to a venerable institution institution well, an institution is an institution is an institution. It doesn't matter how you disguise it. That's beginning to sound like another conspiracy theory to me. But don't be so paranoid, Shimon. <laughs>